but it's hard for me to jump in there with those young people and run around all crazy like. So I like those mid tier. I like those mid tier companies that have and, and you know mid. What is mid tier? Well, mid tier you know could start as with you know ten million dollars and could go all the way up to you know for me five hundred million dollars. It depends on if it's a manufacturing company or a consulting company or most of my clients are consultants or software companies. That's my client base, and in those spaces. Uh, you know, being a consultant to the consultants, I'm not really competing. So I'm actually working with those guys. Uh, and then uh, with software companies, all they want to do is be able to, excuse me, all they want to do is be able to, uh, you know, most of the time scale their business. So how do they take their software product, their app or their platform or whatever it is, uh, and grow it across the U.S. and grow it international. Well, that's hard to do. You got to find distributors and retail partners and things like that. So I help them do that. But uh, yeah, I think that our our good market is not too small, not too big, in somewhere in the middle. I think that's easiest for us. And 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 if you can also deal with the top guy, that's a lot better. Because if you're dealing with a big organization, and it's a mid-level manager and he has to get permission or you have to go through procurement or you have to write a formal big long proposal that's that's not a good recipe for success for an independent yeah and sometimes could feel threatened yeah yeah that's right but for you what i found you know because again i was one of the guys super big um sometimes though uh the division you're working with has autonomy and, and pretty much above this broader stance. You know, at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah, if you can find the buyer, the key thing is who's going to write the check, who's going to sign the contract. So if you can find the buyer and it's in a division or in a department or in a, in a uh, subsidiary and you're dealing directly with that individual, yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Oil and gas projects are big, huge, giant, complex projects and chemicals and all that. And I think also you need kind of a, an expertise, not a deep, deep, deep one, but it's hard to be just a generalist. I think you can, you, you need to have general consulting skills, but then also have some expertise. And it can be like we put up here, uh, a vertical expertise, and it can be a horizontal expertise like this. Could, you know, yeah. Um, could you speak a little bit to more of the partnership where it's not so much of a formal agreement, but you're, you're, there's another company that's sort of in the same space um, for, for a business consultant. It might be a commercial real estate agent, mm -hmm. something like that, where, you, where you're really just saying, hey, let's get to know each other, and I'll, you know, we're, we're after the same folks, but in different ways. <coughs> Can you speak to how to kind of set those up? Yeah, I, I th the main thing is, do you have a relationship with the person? And if you know the person, there's people that I, for example, in my company, I haven't done any advertising or any real commercial activities just because I've built out a network of executives over 30 years, but I work hard at maintaining that. So I'm very faithful and very, and if I can help people to make introductions. so. Know the person yourself, and if you don't know them, get somebody that does, and then kind of broker it. So the relationship is extremely important. If you have a good relationship, you can always figure it out. And then the second thing is, how by coming together are you stronger than being apart? And if you can't answer that question, you don't have a value proposition for the partnership, probably, you know, not really useful. Most of the time people want a partnership so I have access to more accounts, more clients. And so, but at, you have to have a give-get model. What are you bringing to the table if you're getting, receiving client references? You know, and it could be delivery expertise. It could be, I know another client or I'll go to a meeting. I like the idea a lot of going to the meetings together. I'm just doing a deal here in town with a, a company, uh, about a $15 million company. 
and uh, you know, he wants me to work on his strategy and his uh, internal processes and everything. And I said, I'll do that. But what I really want to do is go visit clients with you and your team and go on site and do things like that and do on site coaching and also see how you're selling and uh, uh, add some value through that process. I know how to do that pretty well. I've been in boardrooms and all the way down on shop floors. So, you know, I feel comfortable in those situations. So go to see a client together, uh, you know, uh, go out to lunch together, you know, I mean, yeah, hang out and you don't need, if it's a relationship based partnership, you got a friend that does something and, you know, she can refer you here or there, you know, what goes around comes around. I really believe in, you know, pay it forward, you know, like we talk about or net weaving, we call it now, you know, where you're actually, if you just take, 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 well, obviously, you know, but you can't just give, give, give either. You got to have that balance somewhere in there, you know? And so, and sometimes like, for example, in my network, excuse me, come right over here. In my network, for example, there might be a company that gives a lot more than it gets well, that relationship's not going to be sustainable. So I've got to work hard to find something that they get back so that, uh, but we don't want it to be, uh, you know, I got this, you got that, let's do that, you know, and yeah, yeah, otherwise it's just not going to work. But you can give in many different ways, you know, and uh, yeah. Well, if it's, a, if it's a friendly relationship, the example I think that you gave was a, meal, a real estate partner or something or something, you know, so it's just like, I've got friends that call me and say, Troy, can you come to this meeting or can you help me do this? Sure. We don't have a formal agreement, but I usually sign an NDA, at least an NDA. That's, that's good. You should have a standard NDA, one page and just, you know, and if somebody will sign that, then they're serious about working together. So you don't have to define everything. Now, if it's more complex, then yeah, I would say you need a, a, a one-page letter of intent or letter, letter of interest or something like that. We had a question over here, sorry. There's a recovering banker about many years' experience who belongs to one guy, despite the best of analysis, and he's got a relationship with all the clients and See, see this coming a mile away from all the little red flags that have popped up that kind of talked yourself out of, oh, next quarter things will get better. So what would be an example of your situation where you thought you did everything right? Everybody was honest coming into it with common alignment of goals, but it ended badly. Yeah, on, on loans, I don't know. But... You know what I mean, just from a business perspective. Yeah, well, well sometimes it, projects don't work. Sometimes projects don't work and, and you have to just suck it up and, and, you know, and be honest and, you know, yeah, sometimes, and sometimes you say, sometimes I've said to a client, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll give you an extra five days on this project for free because we haven't met the goals that you wanted. I prefer instead of lowering the price, giving more time. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a, yeah, you want to do periodic reviews, and if it's a big partnership, probably quarterly. Uh, the uh, if you look at Brexit, for example, right now, which is a partnership for the European Union. But, but I mean, look at the contracts. The contract to join the European Union was was uh, 450 pages long. The clause to get out was six pages long. Well, nobody had thought of that. They hadn't thought through that carefully enough. And, you know, uh, it's a mess. It's a big mess. And there's all kinds of complexities involved. Uh, but one thing is partnerships should be created, but they also should be uh, disengaged. So you, uh, I, I believe in being fluid in that. And most of the time, once you set it up, you're kind of locked in, you know. And so... Uh, Party of question. Yeah. yeah. Your real life experience has been talking about being fluent, and this might help a lot of other people. I don't want to get on business development to say, mm -hmm. guess what? Everybody who's an independent consultant, no matter what you're doing, you are now a business developer for yourself. So, um, right? 
<laughs> Nothing happens unless somebody sells something. So yeah. share, share some of your experiences, particularly, you know, when you're in that box, and, and I've learned that you've got to be a real bill check, you know, you're down in the third quarter and you come back at the same team, yeah. and you're wiped out. But what happened? You yeah. changed the playbook, right? Yeah. So sometimes you're there with the perception that you're in box B, but the client starts talking about C. So how did you pivot? You know, did you ever come across that situation where all the time. Yeah. This happened to me yesterday. I was downtown at a meeting yesterday and uh, uh, walked in and I'd written a proposal and I'd met with the guy and he had his other partner there with him. And he's, and they said, Oh, well, we don't want to do that anymore. And I said, well, you know what, you want to stop the meeting and go have a beer? You know, I mean, what? Uh, yeah. and they said, well, no, 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 we, maybe we can do something else. So then we use the meeting as an exploratory, but, I told him, I said, I'm not going to go around the merry-go-round 15 times while you figure it out and, and write these proposals and tell you what to do, because that's what I do for a living. That's paid engagement. So you've got to find some way to, you know, in the next 45 minutes while we have time, because you don't want to do what I, what you asked me to do, and I suggested to find another subject. And if you do, I'll try it one more time, but then we can't move it around anymore and it wasn't the problem of price or time or skills or competition or anything like that they just had changed their mind between my first meeting and the second meeting so what is the pivot well don't for one thing is that I learned very early on in big four consulting don't confuse sales and delivery if I only did projects that I knew how to do I wouldn't have done anything. <laughs> so you, you always have to have a little, you know, panic because God, what am I going to do? You know, well, how do you do? And so uh, uh, you got to figure it out. And if you don't know, you get other people that know how to do it and get advice and things like that. And uh, for example, when I started my career uh, in France, I was working in Paris, worked there for, for 12 years, like Jim said. And at that time, I was one of the few people that was really fluent and good in English and in an international guy. Today, it's not the case. So I got on assignments way over my head. Oh, it was panic city. I mean, I was younger and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle the client. I didn't, it was a foreign country. So, you know, you just, yeah. And, but if you work hard and you're nice and you try your best and you have some skills and intelligence and high energy, and good relationships, you can get through a lot of that. Yeah. And if you work for a big company, you can call, call them for help, you know, and if you're in this group, you can call each other a little bit for help, you know, and you don't want to do it too often, but yeah, this is a, a resource for, uh, for, for, for help. But yeah, it happens all the time that they say they want something and then you pitch it and then they don't want that. They want something else. Somebody over here had a, Remark or question? No. Sure, I've, I've got a, um, a question. Um, I've uh, spent some time with some folks with um, that had been with uh, GE, for instance, and um, uh, they told me that their culture was oftentimes if they had a business unit, a sort of startup or something, that uh, it operated very, very much like a traditional entrepreneurial startup situation where. They didn't have tons of corporate resources. They had to sort of fend uh, for themselves in a lot of cases. Um, which, which creates more opportunity, I think, for, you know, us, for instance, and that Fortune 500 realm. So, do you have any thoughts about how to... Well, they call that entrepreneur instead of, you know, right. so you're inside the company, but you've got a startup within the company. Right. They can't afford to get to Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Th those are good targets for us, yeah. Any, uh, any recommendation or ideas on how to, you know, well, identify those situations? How to identify them, I don't know. You can read the press and see if they're starting up little small, you know, boutique initiatives. Uh, and then also, I'm also an entrepreneur, just like you now. And, you know, we're scrambling and we're hustling. And it'd be better to work with someone like me other than a big company for, for questions of price and also for a question of, uh, you know, you're faster, you're more nimble, you're, you know, you can adjust quicker and uh the projects probably aren't so complex at that level yeah uh it depends you know sometimes in small some of these smaller start especially in life sciences we talked about that 
the, the, the complexity of developing drugs or, you know, creating a new medical device or getting approval. Those are, can be pretty complex, but 